Okay, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk about our work on secure network provenance, which is a secure forensic system that works in untrusted environments. And this is a joint work with my collaborators from University of Pennsylvania and Georgetown University. So let me start with a concrete motivating example based on network routing. So let's say there is a system administrator, Alice, observes some strange behavior in the system. For example, the route to Foodle.com has suddenly changed to something unusual. Then Alice wants to know what happened and what caused this change. Then there could be multiple reasons. Some of them are innocent reasons, like the link between node B and the scene uh, was down during this time. And, some, and it could also be a symptom of an ongoing malicious attack where the, the, a, a malicious attack is uh, changing the router configuration to switch the traffic and the um, sniffing uh, information. So Alice wants to know what exactly happened, whether it is an innocent reason or it is an ongoing malicious attack. And this is important because uh, there is an incident uh, in March 2010 that the traffic from Capitol Hill got redirected through uh, a China ISP. If it is a second case, then this could look really ugly. And this is not just about uh, network and routing. And this situation also applies to other application like distributed hash tables, um, cloud computing, or online multi-gaming. And in all these scenarios, our goal is to uh, provide secure forensic in an adversarial environment. And uh, the system administrator can use this forensic information to explain the unexpected results. So ideally, we want this solution that instead of wondering what happened, Alice can request an explanation of the state from the network. He can say, well, please explain why this route to Foodle.com changed. And ideally, network will respond that, well, because someone accessed to uh, access uh, router D and it changed the configuration from X to Y, and that's why this route changed. This sounds awesome, but this is not really realistic, simply because adversary can lie about things, about what they did. So adversary may want to cover up the intrusion and they can say, well, everything looks fine at my place, and I have this new route because I receive a route advertisement from router E. And basically, the adversary want to uh, fabricate plausible but incorrect re responses and to point accusations to innocent nodes. So to address this challenge, many of you may have seen work uh, from previous uh, publications such as uh, Backtracker, uh, pass, uh, revert, or uh, A2M, and this system usually assumes some trusted components deployed in the system, such as a trusted OS kernel, or a virtual machine monitor, or trusted uh, hardware. And what if we take out this assumption, since these components may have bugs or be compromised themselves? Then we ask a question in our work that, are there any alternatives that do not really require such trust but can still work in this untrusted environment. In particular, in our solution, we assume a very pessimistic uh, threat model that we don't assume any trusted component and a powerful adversary has full control over a sub uh, arbitrary subset of the network. And once a node is compromised, then it can behave arbitrarily. So basically, it is a Byzantine fault. An ideal guarantee we want is the explanation for system state is always complete and accurate in any cases. But this is fundamentally impossible. There are some reasons. And uh, for example, if 14 nodes communicate with somebody outside of the system, or the 14 nodes, then they communicate secretly between themselves. Then basically there's nothing the other nodes can do to detect such behavior and to include those things in the explanation. So what is the guarantee that we can provide? So in our work, uh, the secure network provenance, we provide this realistic guarantee that if there is no fouls, then the explanation is guaranteed to be complete and accurate. And if there is Byzantine fault, 
then the explanation, some part of the explanation may be tempered, but we will always be able to link this temper uh, to at least a 140 node. And let me give you one example. And in this case, the explanation, some part of the explanation may be tempered because uh, the adversary uh, deletes the information. But we'll be able to link this tempering to uh, router D, which is compromised. And we have an evidence to uh, show that uh, this is the case and that a third party can verify this evidence. This is a slightly weaker guarantee than what we ideally want. But this is still very useful since at least we know which node is compromised and then we can take it out from the system. And this is a very informal, like high level presentation of uh, what is a guarantee we can provide. And we have uh, formal definitions and the proofs in the paper um, and uh, there's more details there. So, I have told you um, the goal of our work. So next, I will tell you how we achieve this goal using secure network provenance, and how we maintain the provenance efficiently, and how we process promise queries. And finally, I will present our evaluation result and conclude the talk. So the first question to ask is what explanation should it look like? Actually, uh, we borrow an idea from database community which is called provenance. And the provenance at a high level is to explain the derivation of tuples and it captures dependencies between tuples as graph. And let me show you using this uh, concrete example. So in this system, every node maintains many state. And in this case, it'd be uh, routing information to the other nodes in the system. Let's look at one of them, the route from node A to foo.com. And it depends on the fact that there is a direct link between node A and B, and the B has a shorter route to the final destination. And this dependency uh, goes on and on and, and, um, until you reach uh, router C, and the router C has a direct link to the final destination. And there are other system states in the system and uh, if we draw all those dependencies and remove this underlying network topology, then we can see this dependency forms a graph, and this we call provenance. And the nice thing about the provenance is that the explanation of a particular tuple or state in a system is essentially a tree rooted by that tuple, and this is an example. It is a explanation for the tuple that the route information from um, node A to foo.com. So we adopt this idea and we significantly extend that to address the following challenges uh, to make it work in distributed and interested environment. So the first challenge is that we need to handle past and a transient behavior. So traditional data provenance target on a current stable state but what if the systems never converged? A powerful adversary can tweak the system to prevent it from converging. And or what if the system state no longer exists since the attack happened long ago? And in these scenarios, uh, a traditional uh, prominence model may not help. So our solution is to add an additional temporal dimension into the prominence model. And this is a timeline, and, and uh, we can see the prominence uh, evolves over time as the, pro uh, as the uh, execution goes. And uh, this corresponds to the uh, propagation of uh, network uh, routing information from um, node C to node A. So um, the second challenge is to explain change, not just a state. So traditional data prominence target system state but oftentimes it is more useful to ask why tuple disappeared or appeared instead of why it exists at a certain time. To, to support this functionality, um, we include explicitly change in the provenance and with the introduction of the uh, temporal dimension, the change basically are the deltas between adjacent um, state. And here is one example that uh, reflected the, the dependency between an insertion um, um, route from A to photocom and the insertion of a direct link between node C and photocom. 
And a third challenge, and it is a crucial one, is to partition and secure provenance. So we have to maintain provenance information somewhere in the system. Ideally, we want to have a trusted node that can maintain such information, but we don't have any in our system. So we need to partition the graph among the nodes themselves. And we need to partition it in a way that we can prevent nodes from altering the graph. So this is how we do it. The first step is that we partition the graph and let each node keep vertices about its own, own action. And what about cross-node communication? Who should be able to, um, who should be responsible to maintain that information? And our solution is to split cross-node communications into two vertices, a send, vertice, a send vertex and a receive vertex, such that we can clearly partition the graph. It is good because now every node only maintain information about its own action. If it's tempered the information, then basically itself should be held uh, responsible for this tempering. So, and, uh, and the next step is to make the graph temper evident. And we do this by requ requiring every communication to be authenticated and, and acknowledged such that the signatures associated with the message ac acknowledgement can be used as evidences to show that uh, the other side of, a, of the communication having sent or received information. And, uh, and then for every partition graph along all the boundaries, we have a signature attached. Then we can individually verify each partition graph is valid or not. And of course, there's uh, additional uh, security text needed uh, but um, I, I, uh, there's more details in the paper. And next, I'm going to tell you about how we can maintain this prominence information uh, efficiently and how we process uh, the, the prominence queries. So this is a high-level overview of our system, that our uh, prominence system is a standalone uh, system running side-by-side -side as the primary system that it, it extracts dependency information from the target application uh, by uh, looking at its input, output, and as a specification. And then the extracted dependencies are uh, maintained using this maintenance engine. Since the prominence graph can be huge, especially with this uh, temporal dimension, then uh, we adopt a reactive fashion to maintain provenance, that we only construct the prominence on demand where we use this query engine to review only the paths needed to answer that query at the current time. So next, I will go through these three major pieces of our uh, system. So first, how we extract dependencies? Well, it depends on the application. So if the application already captured the dependency information in its specification, such as declarative uh, networking or SQL queries, then we can infer the prominence based on the specification. Or in some case, we have the um, source code of the application, then we can modify it uh, to report directly this prominence information to our system. And a third option is that we can treat the target system as a black box. And we only define high level um, dependency information based on the observed input and outputs of the black box. Then with this extracted um, dependency information, we maintain that uh, uh, information. And since, since, as I mentioned earlier, uh, since the prominence is, could be um, very expensive, so we only maintain sufficient information for reconstruction at our runtime. And it turns out we only need to maintain the uh, input, output, and non-deterministic events at the runtime, and that is sufficient. So this is an example. Say um, node C send information to node B, and a B acknowledge the information. So at the logs, we, uh, uh, we log this send, a receive, um, acknowledge, and the receive, acknowledge entries. And to make sure that the logs are maintained in a secure fashion, then we use temporary evident logging uh, based on the ideas from peer review uh, from SOSP 2007. And then given this uh, secure locks, uh, we query the prominence uh, recursively. And again, this is a driving uh, example uh, based on natural routing. 
and I'm going to use it to more concretely show how we construct the prominence. So let's say Alice asks a question. Please explain the route from A to Fuller.com. Then it first retrieved the secure log uh, from node A. Then once it received the log, then um, it checked the log for tampering, omission, or equivocation in the logs. If the verification failed, then we find a faulty node. If it uh, passed the verification, then we replay the log to regenerate the prominence graph. And uh, here the prominence graph shows that uh, this routing information depending on the fact that it has uh, received a route adver advertisement um, from um, node B. Then uh, we recursively retrieve this uh, secure log uh, from node B and this process um, continues until that there's no need to further retrieve any secure logs. Then at this stage, we uh, reconstruct the whole prominence graph that explain why route um, from A to Fu uh, existed at that time. So next, I'll present our evaluation results. So I believe uh, there are many questions you want to ask at this stage about our uh, system like uh, what is the usability of the system, how expensive it is at runtime, and what is the current um, performance. So uh, in the paper, we have a prototype implementation called Snoopy, and so we evaluated that and to answer all these questions. But uh, due to um, the time limit, I will only show a subset of the evaluation results. So the first one, uh, usability. We evaluated our uh, prototype implementation Snoopy with three very different applications, uh, the Quagga BGP, Hadoop MapReduce, and the declarative implementation of Cord DHT. So recall that I mentioned there are three ways to extract dependency from the target application and discover all of them. And we use our Snoopy system to explain oscillations caused by uh, router misconfiguration and detect uh, tempered map workers that return incorrect results and an um, eclipse attack. So basically, um, our Snoopy system uh, that can apply it to three very different applications and uh, solves problems uh, reported in existing work. And hopefully this is evidence to show that our system is, uh, uh, is applicable to a diverse application. So next, I'm going to present uh, our evaluation results for the runtime overhead, or more particularly, the storage overhead. And in the graph, the x-axis is the um, applications we have been evaluated on, and the y-axis is the per node log growth in megabytes per minute. And uh, here is the result. And basically, uh, the, the overhead varies from application to application. But overall, the overhead is fine. Like, uh, to maintain one week of data, even for the most expensive one, the Quagga one, it requires uh, 7.3 gigabyte. And even for one year of worth of data, then to, for, for Quagga, um, it can be easily fit into a commodity disk. And more concretely, we look at the, the breakdown of the overhead for Quagga. And it turns out over 50% of the overhead was due to signatures and acknowledgments, since it uh, sent information uh, very frequently. So in the paper, we explore the optim optimization that we batched messages, and uh, such that we can amortize the overhead for signatures and acknowledgments. And the, the result shows that the optimization would greatly uh, reduce this overhead. And the third uh, and the final um, evaluation result I would like to uh, report here is the query latency. And again, this uh, query latency varies from application to application, but uh, the overhead is reasonable uh, since most of the query results are returned within tens of seconds, and we consider that is fast enough for a uh, system administrator to uh, react to an unexpected behavior. And uh, if we look more concretely, like in for, for Hadoop, the overhead was largely due to replaying the logs. On the other hand, uh, for, for, for Quagga, then 
the overhead was uh, dominated by very fine logs and the snapshots. But overall, the, the overhead is quite uh, reasonable. So finally, uh, let me summarize our work. So we present a secure network of provenance, which is a secure forensic system that works in an untrusted environment. And uh, we require no trust components in the system, and as we can still provide very strong guarantees even in the presence of Byzantine faults. And we have a formal uh, proof available in a technical report. And we significantly extend the traditional uh, provenance uh, model, um, and we develop uh, efficient uh, maintenance and acquiring technique uh, in a re reactive fashion. And finally, uh, we have evaluated our system on three very different applications, including Quagga, Hadoop, and the Quad. And it shows uh, our approach is um, application independent. And uh, here is our um, project website, and it, it has um, more information about this project. And um, that concludes my talk, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Yang Tang from Columbia. I was wondering if your system can be easily deployed. In other words, can, you, uh, can your system work with the traditional routers? Um, okay, so, so one of our application is Quagga, and Quagga is like, a, it is implemented in legacy language, it is in C++. Then, um, actually, we did not touch the source code for Quagga, and what we did is to uh, observe the input and output of Quagga. Then, uh, but we can still infer high-level um, dependencies based on this uh, input and output. So yes, I think our um, approach is, um, is uh, applicable even to legacy applications. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Bunch since uh, nobody else is standing up. Um, Mark Curini, Harvard University. So um, I'm wondering, uh, what what do you use for a query language? Oh, that's that's a good question. Is that in the paper? Or? Um, so that's a very good question. So in this work, we did not really look into the query language part, and uh, we have um, an ongoing work to look into that. And uh, for this, every uh, query we execute is like just um, um, looking to one particular tuple or uh, tuple change in, okay. the, in the execution. So are you, you're not doing any querying on graph structure or, or um, so path expressions or things like that? So we, we did not have a query language that allow you to like specify, well, I, I, const, uh, I constrain say this pro uh, the prominence graph should have this, this, this property. Uh, that is an ongoing work, and uh, actually we adopt, uh, say, the, the pro, uh, ProQL as the query language, but in this work, we did not explore that part. But uh, the prominence is a graph, and it is, as I mentioned, it is recursively um, uh, generated, so it is a still a graph, and uh, we use the um, declarative networking based on that um, engine to do to, to this um, recursive querying. We have a... Uh, a uh, provenance query language for you at Harvard, if you're interested. Yes, <laughs> uh, of course, I'm interested. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thanks. Hi, Parijat Aditya from MPISWS. Uh, so if I understood you correctly, you will have to manually define the notion of correct, uh, like a manually define the correct, what is correct behavior, and you, you'll have to manually write a state machine which does the replay for you. So uh, do you have any ideas, like how, how efficiently can you do that for increasingly complex programs? Is there a way to automate that? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So um, as I mentioned, there's three ways to extract uh, the dependency information. If it is written in like a declarative language, then, then this step is quite easy. We can just infer from that. And if it is legacy application, yes, we, we do need to have the user defined like what is the correct logic that a node should be expected to behave. 
yes, that, that we, we assume that. Then, um, and prominence is like you, you capture the dependency and it is not necessary, you need to uh, capture like a to the very detail, like you, you go to the OS or something. But you can still define very high level dependency like at the application level. So it is how much cost you would like to pay, then you get this much detail about the dependencies. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you.